Ruth came through the wall and sat on the edge of my bed, arranging her blue velvet dress so as not to wrinkle it. She looked ravishing as ever. Her thick auburn hair, full of waves that caught the moonlight. Her cream-colored skin smooth and luminous. Her bright red lips, forming that certain smile by which she had always been known. Her smile could not be duplicated by any other woman. God knows I tried countless times, standing in front of the bathroom mirror with Max Factor's Chinese red applied meticulously to my lips, twisting them this way and that way, trying in vain to imitate the beautiful one, always falling short by a mile, wiping the damn stuff off finally with a wad of tissue, admitting defeat, admitting the futility of my actions. No one but no one could smile the bright red smile of Ruth. She captured the market. I bought her the blue velvet dress for her 45th birthday with money I borrowed from the household account. The rent was late that month. We ate a lot of hot dogs. Thank you, she said. A very unemotional. Thank you, and hung the dress in her closet. I never saw it on her until now and why she chose to wear it on this night is beyond me. Her eyes looked right through me as she said. So how have you been? I became immediately cold. A chill that struck me first in the solar plexus and then moved outward into every fiber of my being until I shuddered and gasped and vaulted upright pulling the covers around me in a feeble attempt to get warm. It was no use. There was a feeling of ice cubes painfully lodged in my esophagus. What's the matter? She said. You look as though you've seen a ghost. That's a good one. You come through the wall in the middle of the night and ask me how I've been. I suppose you would like me to say fine. Well, I haven't been fine. I've been awful. Unspeakably awful. She looked away. As if I had wounded her. As if the news of my awful condition was too distasteful for her to acknowledge as if she had not come to be bummed out by my puny despair. The same old bullshit. We sat there in silence. I stared a hole in the ceiling. She stared a hole in the floor. Nothing changes. I can't stay long. Why? Are you going to a party? Yes. As a matter of fact I am. A real humdinger of a party. But I have a short time to spare, and I wanted to spend it with you. Oh. I see. Quality time. Right? Why must you be so unforgiving? I did the best I could. That's what they all say. Every last one of them. You'll say it too someday. I doubt it. Why? Are you so perfect? Hell no. And I don't pretend to be either. And I suppose I did? Of course you did. You were always telling us how perfect you were in one way or another. Aren't you the one who said, My farts don't stink. Really? I said it. I remember it like it was yesterday. You were sitting in the kitchen and you farted. We all laughed. You just shrugged your shoulders and said, At least my farts don't stink. It made us feel pretty damned inferior. Why? Was it true? Yes, it was true. But you didn't have to gloat over it. So, you resent me because my farts were not offensive? No, mother. I resent you because mine are. So watch your diet. Drink lots of water. You know, this is the most ridiculous conversation I've ever had. You always seem to bring out the worst in me. You brought it up. See what I mean? You always have to have the upper hand. You always have to come out smelling like a rose. For God's sake, mother. You'd think you were a saint or something. My eyes returned to the ceiling. Hers returned to the floor. The silence was immeasurable. I've never experienced such absolute silence. I thought it would never end. And then... Ruth farted. Allowed an incredibly explosive fart that shook the room. We looked at each other in total disbelief and broke into wild hysterical laughter. 
The air in the room became suddenly thick with the fragrance of roses. I was dumbfounded. I took her hand in mine. It felt like confetti. And even though it fell through my fingers and onto the floor, my hand was still full of her hand. It was as if I had an endless handful of confetti, falling through my fingers, and yet being replenished at the same time. I worried that the confetti on the floor would build up and become a mountain that would bury us. But that didn't happen. The confetti on the floor didn't accumulate. It disappeared, and made room for more. Ruth could read my mind. She knew I was fascinated and absorbed in the phenomenon of endless confetti. It's not really confetti, you know. It just feels like confetti when you touch me. Some people call it stardust. Others perceive it as sand. It happens when molecules of life collide with molecules of death. One cancels out the other. So what you are really feeling is the energy of nothing and everything at the same time. Life becoming death becoming life becoming death. And so on into infinity. The endless circle. It can't hurt you. Actually. It's good for you. It sharpens your senses. It's extrasensory perception to the nth degree. Neat, isn't it? I pulled my hand away. The confetti sensation ceased. My empty hand felt exhausted. As if it had been holding a boulder for centuries. I wanted Ruth to hold me. I wanted all of my life molecules to mingle and collide with all of her death molecules. I wanted her to cancel me out. Give me the ultimate confetti high. Endless mother love. She read my mind and embraced me as she had never done when she was alive. To be embraced by infinite confetti is the single most illuminating experience that any human being could ever have. Second only to seeing the face of God. To feel everything and nothing at the same time, in a room full of moonlight with one's mother in a blue velvet dress, is beyond the scope of ordinary comprehension. These words that I speak are far from adequate. They are gibberish next to the truth. The embrace lasted only a moment or two. Ruth pulled away from me and said, I don't want you to burn out and become isolated in a separate reality. After all, I had to get up in the morning, pack lunches, take the kids to school do some shopping, balance the checkbook. Life goes on. Even the most gifted metaphysician has to throw a little water on her face now and then. Change her underwear? flaws her teeth. I was at a loss for words. There was so much I wanted to say to her, but now, after the embrace, words seemed indecent, superfluous. What could I possibly say that would come out sounding sane, significant, worthy of this auspicious occasion? You look so beautiful. I'm so glad you're wearing the dress I gave you. I thought you didn't like it. How could I not like it? I love it. It's divine, absolutely divine. Why did you never wear it? I was saving it for a special occasion. It hung in my closet forever, waiting for that special occasion. That special occasion never came, until now. So I'm wearing it, now. I waited forever to wear it, and now I'm wearing it forever. Do you see? It's my forever dress. I couldn't argue with that. It made perfect supernatural sense. And all those years I thought she hated it, when actually she was dying to wear it. Again, I reached for her hand. Again, I felt the confetti-like sensation of it. Again, I swam in her eyes. Became mesmerized by her bright red smile. She fluffed up my pillow and tucked me in. I've got to get a move on. There's a cocktail out there with my name on it. It's not polite to be late for cocktails. The pupils in her eyes turned from black to bright red. She kissed me on the mouth. It was a soft sweet I love you very much Max Factor Chinese red kiss. There. Now you can be famous too. 
she left the same way she came in. Through the wall. So effortlessly, so regally, so perfectly and ruthlessly Ruth-like. The next morning I woke to find a gold tube of Max Factor's Chinese red in my hand, and a beautiful ruthless smile on my face. I should be famous any day now.